Well, good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night message, <clears throat> April 29th, 2020. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah 27. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll pray and we'll dive into this passage this evening. Jeremiah 27, verse number 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck, and send them to the king of Edom, and to the king of Moab, and to the king of the Ammonites, and to the king of Tyrus, and to the king of Zidon, by the hand of messengers, of the messengers which come to Jerusalem, unto Zedekiah, king of Judah. We're going to stop right there, and let's pray, and we'll get into the passage this evening. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the life of Jeremiah, and I pray, Lord, that you would give to us grace to to see clearly that you would open our eyes, that we might behold the wondrous things that are written in your law, that we might know them and love them and submit ourselves to them, and that you would be the great governor of our lives. And I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I begin once again with an apology to those of you who are reading through or intending to read through Dale Ralph, Ralph Davis's True Words for Tough Times. I had said that I was going to follow along through his uh, five chapters, and I have kind of, sort of, um, but in, in his book, he deals with, his lecture is Jeremiah 27, 28, and 29 together, and I just felt like Jeremiah 27 uh, was something we should pause to look at um, a little more in depth. Um, <clears throat> It exposes us, my proposition in the outline will be, it exposes us to the three fundamental truths that really govern human existence, and I, I want to make sure that I deal with them as thoroughly as possible. Uh, last week, we made mention of Jehoiakim. Uh, Jeho Jehoiakim was one of the sons of Josiah. Uh, who went on to become the king of Judah. Uh, he was placed as that king by Pharaoh, a man known historically as Pharaoh Necho. Um, and uh, he lived to see the Babylonians in attack his country. Uh, his 11-year reign is characterized by God as evil in his sight. Uh, he was appointed about uh, 609 B.C. He was about 25 years of old, uh, years of age. Um, and about four or five years later, the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians in battle, and the land then of Palestine fell under Babylonian control. Um, <clears throat> Jehoiakim served then under these circumstances. The Bible tells us that he served Nebuchadnezzar for three years and then revolted. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 6 tells us that he was hauled away to Babylon um, and he died there. And let me just read to you a couple of verses in Jeremiah 22 that describe how God thought about this man and his kingdom and his life and his death. Jeremiah 22, 18, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> not a pretty picture of not a nice man. But to this man, 
comes Jeremiah wearing a yoke. And, and historically, what's going on, on the one hand, Nebuchadnezzar has to deal with his own issues of his own kingdom and internal conflicts and attacks from other people. And what's going on immediately in our context are people who are trying to address the threat of the mighty Babylonian army. And so we're having a summit, a conference of regional kings to discuss what to do about the Babylonians. To that meeting, Jeremiah <clears throat> is being sent um, in verse number one and verse number two. And Jeremiah is being given this assignment. He is to make a variety of yokes, uh, a number, not a variety, but a number of yokes, um, like you would put on a, a team of oxen or a team of cows uh, to plow the field. And he was to put one on himself uh, with all of the accoutrements that went to it, the straps and all the harnesses and everything. And he was to make one for the king of Edom and the king of Moab and the king of Ammon and the king of Tyre and the king of Zidon. And that's where we are in verses 1 through 3 of Jeremiah 27. Uh, <clears throat> so we're having this political summit. You can, you can kind of see it, folks. We, we see these kinds of things on the news at all time, world leaders meet together and the, their reporters and, and the journalists are there and, and pictures are being taken and ceremony and pomp and meetings are being held. And to them, Jeremiah shows up and he has sent each one of these kings a yoke for them to wear. That brings us then to <clears throat> this kind of conflict that is going to unfold in the rest of the chapter between God and and humanity. Uh, the first fundamental issue then to which we're exposed, I would suggest to you, we see in verses 4 and 5, and that is the ownership of the earth. The ownership of the earth. Verse number 4, these kings get these yokes and they are to be accompanied by this message. Command them to say unto their masters, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. The first fundamental issue is the ownership of the earth. And as you look at verse number four, folks, it is just oozing authority. Authority squishes out of every word almost. Give a command, a word of authority to your masters. That is the word Adon, Adonai, the strong ones. Thus saith the Lord, Jehovah, the one who exists all by himself, the one who has self-existence. He is not just Jehovah, he is the Lord of hosts or of multitudes or of armies. He is the God of Israel. He is the very large God of a very small country. And they are to say to their masters, to their strong ones. So there is all this authority everywhere, but the supreme authority is the authority of Jehovah. Verse number five, I have made the earth, the man, the beast that are upon the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm. Folks, every atom to every star is the result of the work of Jehovah God. Of Jesus Christ, it is said in John 1, 3, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So anytime there is a question about science, about evolution, about theology, about the age of the earth, always we need to keep in mind this issue. Are we teaching or suggesting or Embracing a position that will lead us to deny God's claim of absolute ownership on the earth. This week, perhaps 
the day that I'm recording this, which is Sunday the 26th, is Earth Day. And we live in a world of climate change. And all of these things are argued to be tools of science, but the ultimate end of each of them is that the earth has either its own existence or falls under the authority supremely of men. The Bible position is that the earth is the Lord's and God vests virtually every claim that he makes upon us in the fact of that, that he has created us, that we are in fact his, his by creation, his by salvation. And so we are exposed to this fundamental issue, ownership of the earth. God says it is his. He made the people in it. He made the animals in it. He made it for his purposes. And that leads us then to the second fundamental issue to which we are exposed. And that is his sovereignty. And his sovereignty is really developed then through the remainder of the chapter. And let's just take, well, let's just kind of work through it piece by piece if we could. Verse number five, back to verse number five. Authority, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground by my great power, by my outstretched arm. Sovereignty, I have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. I have given the nations to who I thought should have them. That's the idea that seemed right to me. And what follows then, folks, and I would suggest that you could outline verses 6 through 22 these ways. God's sovereignty, number one, is over kings, verses 6 and 7. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. Thus says the Jehovah, the earth is mine, I made it. I've given it to whom I want, and right now I want to give it to Nebuchadnezzar, and all of you will serve him. And you will serve him and his son and his son's sons, and when Nebuchadnezzar's time is up, then others will come in, and they will serve themselves at his expense. So God is sovereign over kings. In verses 8 through 11, God expresses his sovereignty over kingdoms. Not just individual kings, but over the very political, civil, governmental structures within them. Verse number 8, and it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. So kingdoms that will not submit to the rule of God, which is the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, will be crushed by God. On the other hand, verse number 11, but the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. So God is sovereign over kingdoms. He makes one king more powerful than others. He demands other kingdoms submit to them, and if they will not, they will suffer, and if they will, they will endure. And then in verses 12 through 22, God expresses his sovereignty over his kinsmen. God is sovereign not only over the kings of the world, not only over the kingdoms of the world, God is sovereign over the lives of his very own people. 
Verse number 12, I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words. God's children are not exempted from God's sovereignty. Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die? Thou and thy people by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon. God is sovereign over his own children. Verse number 19, jump down to verse number 19. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the bases, concerning the residue of the vessels that remain in the city. And if you go back first. Kings and chapter about chapter 8, 7 and 8 and read about the construction of the temple. You can read about all of those items. Verse number 20, which Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took not when he carried away captive Jeconiah the son of Jehoiakim king of Judah from Jerusalem to Babylon and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yea, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. So God is sovereign. God is able to rule all things. And I want to just pause here and talk briefly about the issue of sovereignty because it is at times intimidating and at times confusing and at times misunderstood. And I make no claim of authority over all things pertaining to sovereignty, but sometime in, sometimes in, in fundamental circles like ours, people accuse us who believe strongly in the sovereignty of God of treating it as if God controls every conversation. In other words, that God, when we say God is sovereign, what we mean is that God is putting words in people's mouths and controlling their every movement and their every action. I think that is certainly possible. God could have created a race of robots programmed to do only what he had told them to do. But that is not what God did. God created a race of people, and he gave them minds, and they have the ability to think and to to reason and to weigh and to fashion and to decide. That does in no way undo God's sovereignty, nor does it really compete with God's sovereignty. I make my decisions. I think my thoughts. I ponder my actions, I weigh out the consequences. Biblically, sovereignty is like this. Let's just take a couple of examples from right here in the passage, and let me give you a couple of other references to to get a better idea of how sovereignty works. Here's God's sovereignty at work. Now, I've, verse number six, I have given all these lands into the land of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and my servant and the beasts of the field. I have given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land come. Then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. So there's sovereignty. God puts Nebuchadnezzar and his descendants in charge. In verse number 8, you have another dimension of it. The nation which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, God will wield his sovereignty to punish. Verse number 12 or verse number 11, the nation that will submit to his sovereignty, that nation will survive. So you have, folks, side by side, the sovereign will of God and the activity of men. And one is not encroached by the other. This is the way biblical sovereignty works. 
It works like this. Let me just read to you 2 Samuel 17, 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the Archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. You recall this is back at the, the revolt of Absalom, and there was a discussion whether they should go right away after David with a few men and chase him down, or whether they should wait and gather a large army. And there was a big internal debate about what the best way would be. And the people said, The counsel of Hushai the Archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. Because the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. So the men were talking, they were planning, they were discussing, they were exercising their own human reasoning, and yet God was accomplishing his sovereign purposes in that. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 25, with reference to the sons of Eli. Eli is pleading with his boys to behave themselves. And he says, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? And then we are told, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. So certainly God is sovereign over our hearts and God uses our hearts. Solomon said, the heart of the king is as the rivers of water. <clears throat> the Lord turns them wherever he wishes. So we are exposed to the fundamental issue of God's authority over the earth and God's sovereignty over men. And that brings us then in this chapter to what I think is the third fundamental issue of human existence, and that is human responsibility. What is a man to do? What are men to do in light of the fact that God rules the world and he rules it absolutely? Well, <clears throat> look at verse number nine. In brief, <clears throat> what men are supposed to do is what God tells them to do, even if they don't like to do it. This is my responsibility before the Lord, is to do what he tells me to do, even if I don't like to do it. So in verse 8, the nation that will not serve will be destroyed. Because God is sovereign and it's his earth. Therefore, verse number 9, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land and that I should drive you out and ye should perish. Verse number 12. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will ye die? Same thing, verse number 14. Therefore hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. For I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Also I spake to the priests and to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hearken not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Wherefore should this city be laid waste? But if they be prophets, and if the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and at Jerusalem go not to Babylon. And then the passage that we already read, God said, they are going. 
What is proper human responsibility? Folks, it, it is one thing. It is submission. It is submission. It is simply doing what God tells us to do. It is refraining from doing what he prohibits. It is not trying to get our own goal and our own power in our own way. It is not trying to find enough who will argue against the word of the Lord that perhaps it can be overthrown. God owns the world. God is sovereign over it. There are things that he has decreed that he will do. And the responsibility of men is to submit to his word, even if it is an unpleasant word to them. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, this of course requires of us a very thorough knowledge of what you have commanded. And so expand our understanding of the word. Secondly, Father, it requires of us great skill, wisdom in using the word so that we might make right applications of its truths. Above all, Lord, it requires your gracious work in our hearts to desire to be submissive to your word, to not trust to all the voices in the world and the voices in our head telling us what is right and true and effective, but to believe you. And I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen.